Okay, so uh, we'll bring the slides back up. Thank you. And uh, just uh, run through a few more details about the program and then open it up uh, for discussion. Oh, we're a little bit. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, the history of the solicitation, we started this in 2002. This was on the advice of the Advisory Council. Uh, particularly, Maynard Olson was very strong about the idea of having investigator-initiated uh, ideas, and so that's carried through. Uh, we've, we refined the program announcement after a couple of years of experience because we were uh, it's sort of a broad description of what we're looking for because we're not trying to constrain it too much. But uh, So we were able to refine the way we described what the program is about. And also at that point, NIMH joined the solicitation. I don't think Andrea and Thomas are here. Uh, they weren't able to make it. Uh, but um, And then every, essentially every three years we, revo we renewed the program announcement w after discussions like this with the, with the council. So we, and we renewed it with high enthusiasm. Uh, we did have a, 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 a sort of a pilot project, the P20, for a while. Uh, we, never, we had very few applications. And we never made an award, so we just decided to take that out of the program. Uh, we couldn't actually articulate what that would look like uh, very effectively. Uh, the, we're off, on the 2010, we're off the three-year cycle just because the stuff about the application changed, and we, so we had to issue a new program announcement. And now we're at the end of the previous one and need to uh, get some input from you. So these next few slides are just have here in the set in case we need to come back to them quickly, but they're the same ones that you saw before. And the only thing I'm going to add here is to stress that whereas originally the Minority Action Plan was integrated with the SEGS program announcement, now we've split that off and it's a separate application. But when you apply for a SEGS, for a SEGS grant, you must also put in the R25 for the Diversity Action Plan grant. And you cannot be awarded a SEGS grant until we've worked with you in case your original application for the, for the DAP wasn't of, of, of appropriate quality. We'll work with people to improve it so that they can run an effective diversity action plan program. The, so these must go together. Uh, I should say, if we have two grants in one city, then they'll work together, uh, not get two separate DAPs. A SEGS is not. Sometimes it's useful to say what something isn't. So a SEGS is not just an expand. It's not supposed to be just uh, 10 years out of somebody's lab of what they usually do. Um, it's not a program project. That is, it's not a bunch of projects operating pretty much independently that have a little bit of complementarity. It should not be a, a, a resource or an infrastructure for an existing department. And actually, all of the things that are listed here were examples of applications that we got in the first few years. And so it helps to say what they're not. It's not primarily for the, for the collection of a set of data uh, in the absence of some novel concept or methodology, though we understand that in order to demonstrate that something is working, you may have to collect some data. And it's not just outstanding science that fails to meet SEGS criteria. And this is the hardest one, because we talk with lots of people who have a lot of fantastic ideas, really outstanding investigators. Uh, and then the question is just, does it meet the other criteria of the SEGS? So it's not that some of these other things are bad science. Uh, but they don't, does, uh, a lot of the ideas that we hear about uh, don't rise to uh, the level of, uh, that the staff believes will meet the criteria of this. And the staff's assessment is, some, is pretty strongly reinforced by the review process. Uh, okay, so these are, uh, uh, again, they're interdisciplinary, integrated, and, and synergistic. So by synergistic, one of the things I mean that we tell people when they're coming to us with their ideas, uh, if you have a component that is not absolutely necessary for the other parts of the project to work, don't put it in the application. It should not have stuff hanging out there on the edge because you know, it's the part department chair and the department chair wants you to put his project in there. Sorry for department chairs. Um, uh, the, these can include an ethical, legal, and societal component. It's not required. As you know, there is a separate program for the seers, for centers, uh, but uh, if it fits well with the project, there can be an LC component. Uh, we, we, uh, have, uh, we require a management plan for the team, but we also feel that these require a very strong, require very strong direction from a PI. We require a PI to be at 30% effort for this project. 
And so that's why I asked the question to reinforce Didi's statement. Because somebody, ha if you got a whole bunch of PIs at 5%, you know, it's, it's going to be particularly hard to make the decision. We have to drive in this direction. We have to now narrow the project and do the things that are going to get us to our goal, uh, hopefully in 10 years. So that's why we require a PI at 30% effort. So all these are features that we're essentially asking you about. Uh, should these continue to be in the program? Um, during the, for, for the review process, the peer review process includes an applicant interview. They come into town for two hours and they get their chance in front of the review committee uh, to, to, for questions to be asked. These are particularly, it's just particularly important when you have um, these multidisciplinary projects, when you have things that are risky. Uh, that means they're not going to be able to explain everything in the application. And so the reviewers get a chance to, you know, to bounce ideas off and see how people are thinking about the problem more so than you can in, in the grant application. Um, and we feel, feel for this amount of money investment, we, we want to have that kind of information in the review process. Uh, there is an administrative site visit after three years. Uh, we bring along a team of, uh, of outside, uh, of, of, you know, of extramural scientists uh, to help us assess the progress in that project and, and to determine whether we would like to invite uh, a, a, a competitive uh, renewal. Um, people can submit uh, competitive renewal. We can't stop them. But w uh, I think in every case, uh, people have gotten extremely good advice from, the re from these uh, administrative site visits. And then uh, the renewal itself requires not only that you're meeting your initial goals, but you've got to be staying at the state of the art. Obviously, if the field is sort of passing by, there's no point in NHGRI funding another five years if, if the rest of the field is caught up. Uh, again, uh, so the more details on the budget. Operating costs, people are allowed to request up to $2 million a year direct costs. Uh, these budgets are big enough that we uh, essentially require people to figure out over the five years uh, how to reallocate budgets to keep things running so we don't adjust for inflation. In addition to the uh, two, $2 million uh, we, we, that we call operating costs, uh, uh, applicants may request up to $500,000 spread over the five years of specialized equipment. Uh, we've already said uh, uh, the duration of, of each segment is up to five years, maximum of 10 years. There have been a few awards that we've made for shorter times for various uh, management, uh, sort of program management purposes. Uh, so not all of them are awarded for five years. I should say not all of them are awarded at the full requested cost uh, for various reasons. Uh, we've made some awards at lower levels. And again, the, this is another important question for council consideration. We've always said that we anticipate funding a maximum of about 10 of these. If we had 10 at $3 million, that's about 8% of the extramural budget, which would be a significant uh, 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 investment. So here are the investments that we've made over the years since the program started. Uh, we've been up as high, as you see, as, as about $25 million in one year. Uh, what numbers am I, and, and right now our commitment for FY14 is a, as a $14.5 million. That's a commitment coming from previous years. As you know, we'll be looking at new applications uh, in the closed session. Um, what are these numbers? This is the Genome Institute dollars, excluding the Diversity Action Plan. We account for that separately. That's been up as high as $3 million a year. Of course, the, uh, the diverse, um, actually up to $3 million in one year of diversity action plans that were associated with SEGS. There are diversity action plan programs associated with some, some other grants programs also. But usually it's a lot lower than that. Um, we also invested from Genome Institute uh, $2.4 million uh, in the stimulus years of stimulus funds. And importantly, uh, we've leveraged our funds and NIMH has leveraged their funds. They've co-funded particular awards uh, for a total of just over $5.5 million. Um, spread out over the awards and over the years. And they also invested $6 million of stimulus funds to get started one of the, uh, one of the pro projects. So this is a very highly selective program. We've received 75 new or amended applications, out of which there have been 15 awards. Uh, we received 12 competing renewals or uh, amended competing renewals and made five awards out of that. In addition to that, we've talked with dozens of, uh, of potential applicants. So uh, we probably talk with three times as many potential applicants as actually come in as applications. We try to stress over and over again in the, in the program announcement, talk with us first. These are big, hard, complicated applications to write. 
We don't want people to write them if they're very clearly not going to be qualified. So uh, quite a, some fair number of people make an inquiry and, that, and then they decide not to apply. But each year we have uh, almost twice as many people who send a letter of intent, and these are usually about four pages, uh, very densely written letters of intent. And then the team of us here within the Institute and, and in IMH look at these and provide feedback. Uh, and sometimes it's, uh, this is just so far off that we don't think you should apply. And other times it's, here's what you would need to do to modify this in order to, in our opinion, submit a successful application. So uh, uh, David had a graphic that showed sort of what the awards were. Here is just in a different format. The awards that have been made over time, the, the first four years, and again, I'm, I've indicated the, 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 the uh, grants that received co-funding from NIMH, and then subsequently uh, a, another set of awards. Three years are missing, 2005, 2008, and 2012. In those years, we didn't make any awards. Uh, and as you see again here, is the, the renewals. So one, two, three, four. Um, should be five renewals, right? Are they up there? Yes, one, two, three, four, five. Five renewals. Not all of these renew. Uh, so uh, I, you have these in front of you. I just want to make the point that you've heard from two of the SEGs uh, and just the kinds of projects that people are doing are addressing, uh, uh, I would say, deep, important problems in genomics, contemporary problems in genomics. Uh, so here we have uh, not only single cell uh, transcriptome, but very high, very large numbers of single cell transcriptomes is one of the goals here. And then being able to engineer human genomes so that, for example, you would take, uh, take fibroblasts from an individual, differentiate those down different differentiated pathways. In those cells, modify uh, 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 specific nucleotides in promoter regions that are not random, but that are the variations that you find in patients and test the uh, transcript transcriptomic and other outcomes of those particular variants in different tissue types. Those are pretty hard experiments to do in real people. So uh, I, I think I'd, just for time, I'm not going to go through these. You have these in front of you if you'd like to look at them. And these are all what I, I just extracted some key sentences from the websites of each of these. You can get to these websites from our website. So I'm going to uh, move on. Sorry, those three uh, groups and the other ones who I didn't include. Uh, as, as was mentioned, we have an annual grantee meeting with this program. These are pretty interesting meetings because we're really getting people together who don't necessarily talk to each other. Otherwise, they don't necessarily go to the same meetings. They're running the same kinds of big grants. And there's uh, quite, uh, uh, quite interesting uh, intersections that are revealed as people give their talks. It's also been a great opportunity for students to find good postdocs and so forth, and people to move around amongst the SEGs. Uh, 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 including the uh, Diversity Action Plan participants. So the team of uh, program directors who are involved here is uh, significant across the institute. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Lisa, Elise, Adam, Colin, Tina, Peter, Brad, Ajay, Aaron, Jeff, and the other Jeff, I'm the other Jeff, Lou, uh, and Andrea and Tomas from uh, NIMH, and of course Keith, Ken, and Rudy keep us all honest by running fantastic reviews. These are hard to review, and it's an important component of the program. So the questions for you, some of the questions for you, are the ones that I've listed here. Uh, do you support that we continue the program? Uh, we, uh, is the scope about right? We've described in some of the earlier slides what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, we're working on uh, broadening the language to uh, apply across the new strategic plan. Um, some of that's relatively easy. I think we want to maintain the level of innovation, uh, forward-lookingness. Uh, do you think the budget level is okay, the number of awards, and anything I've told you about the program management that you have questions about, or from your own experience that you would suggest that we change? I'd just like to open it up. Rudy, you want to run the... <laughs> More other questions, obviously, about the program. Ready, start us, please. Um, I was wondering whether you have any special guidance you give. It seems like a lot of these programs do involve multiple institutions. Do you give any particular guidance with respect to intellectual property um, across institutions? Um, 
I'm trying to remember if this is one in some program announcements that we have written that we suggest that people work that out before they get the grant. That's the main advice. Because um, it's really messy <laughs> if you try to work it out after you get the grant. Um, uh, but other than that, no. And if you have suggestions about language you think we could include, that would be great. At, at the risk of uh, speaking out here since I'm uh, new on the council, um, I, I think it's a fantastic program. And if what I heard correctly... Stop there. Okay. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and it, I mean, I, li I like it for many reasons. Uh, one is the fact that it is doing things that are risky and are hard to get done otherwise. I like very much that it is investigator-initiated and that um, uh, in some sense it counterbalances I think an, an NHGRI tendency to be a little heavy-handed on the um, management side of, of <clears throat> pushing particular programs. And so I think it's a good counterbalance to that. Um, third thing is, if I heard correctly, that there were um, about half of the SEGs are renewed. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. For something that's supposed to be high risk, I think having a 50% success rate for renewal is actually too high, which to me would suggest that the program is actually too small. You want to see more failure. Yeah. I, just something on, on that, I think that's probably some element of it, but I think also some of these things just take, they're so challenging, it takes a certain amount of time to get get far in, to make the progress that's needed. So there's probably a balance of that. And I, I, I would like to see more SEGS funded as well. I, I think it's a great program. And, and looking around NIH, I don't, I don't see any other programs like the SEGS. Ross, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I, I'd also like to thank David and, and Didi for these presentations and they, uh, they really exemplify uh, how well the program can work. I mean, clearly, uh, uh, high, high, high risk initially. I mean, who, who would have thought sticklebacks, right? You, you know, and, and it's, just, it's informed us so much and, and gotten to the point where, uh, the, you know, these technologies, these approaches are accepted. So they're not high risk anymore. Uh, they're hard still, but, but it's, it's working beautifully. So. Um, and they were the investigator ideas, as Bob said, and uh, investigator initiated is so important. The other thing I think is really important is those years where there weren't any that were uh, uh, funded. It, it, you don't have, it's investigator initiated. If there aren't really sterling, challenging ideas coming forward, you don't put the money out. And so it's, uh, uh, I, it seems to be working very, very well. Howard? So I also think it's a great program, and, and uh, although I'd like to see it expanded, I, I just wonder on the, on the budget constraints. But towards that end, um, it, this does seem to me, because of the su success of this program, of a potential partnership opportunity with some of the other institutes. I mean, I think this is a really unique program uh, that brings together resources, and I really like the time window. Um, you know, you have 10 years, you have to get renewed. It really keeps the pressure on innovation. So, Jeff, can you expand on that, uh, Jeff Schloss? I mean, yeah, I'm listening. So, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, NIMH has been a good partner, but over the years, have we shopped this for other institutes and not had interest, or have we not done a significant shopping? I don't remember. I, I'm, I'm thinking vaguely <coughs> NINDS one year, but I, I'm not sure. Does anybody remember? I, I, I think not, and I, I mean, I think in part we haven't had uh, applicants come to us with something that sounded relevant. I should say on a program announcement, uh, another institute doesn't have to join it for us to go to them if we get an interesting application. They could co-fund, again, it's not a set-aside, it's just a program announcement, which is an expression of interest. So, that, so mechanistically at NIH, that's completely possible to do. Is that what happened originally with NIMS? Is that the, the one institute that you have partnered with? I don't 
think so. I think they saw the program announcement and just liked it. Uh, we have a couple questions in back up. Yeah, do you want to decide the order? Lisa, uh, Lisa, you were up first. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about Bob's question about whether 50% was a good or a bad success rate. Um, and Jeff had mentioned that there is an administrative review um, between the first grant period and um, a potential second grant period. And those are pretty uh, rigorous reviews. Um, we provide a lot of, we bring in outside people and provide a fair amount of feedback. And I think people, applicants have found that really useful. And I think that has not, not always made a difference in terms of whether someone succeeded or not, but I think, I think it actually does help um, in terms of providing really a good, a good um, preliminary view of how the project is going and the direction that they're thinking about moving in. And, and really there's been some correction in those. Uh, when there, there was good stuff that the PIs may not even have identified, but outsiders could find it. And so that might be part of the reason that we have a higher success rate. Lisa, go ahead. Hello? Yes, to address the question about other ICs, um, certainly we can go to any IC. If something comes in with something we think is appropriate for another institute, we absolutely can go there. But I think what happens is that the PIC, that it's genome and mental health, okay, I can do any disease for this process, but you know, I'm going to choose a mental health one. And so I think mental health has really benefited because yeah, lots of point. grants specifically focus on mental health topics. So, you know, that may be a selling point to other institutes. If you're on it, um, there may be a focus there. Does NIBIB have any involvement in this? Because I think, I mean, Didi's project, for example, might be something they'd be really interested in. Well, probably started by predated NIBIB, so, but yeah. before their creation, right? I mean, they haven't been around 10 years, have they? I don't think. Yeah. So, the, so I mean, the only, the, really the only mechanism we have other than to knock on doors, which we could do, uh, these, these program announcements all go into something we call the early notification system so that all the other institutes have an opportunity to see, every institute has an opportunity to see the, every announcement that every other institute posts. So uh, there is that opportunity, but uh, we, uh, we haven't done the door knocking on thing. I just make a comment if, if you do sure get like NIBIB or any of that, and I'm not talking about them specifically, but I, there really is no other yeah. mechanism like a, the SAGS, and I've looked at all the ones of, that are possible across the other institutes, which you would know well, but they have very complex mechanisms and requirements, and I just hope that you wouldn't lose any of the unique features of the SAGS in partnering like that, and so just to make sure you don't lose that. And that's a very important point, actually. When NIMH decided to join us, they said, we like this program. All we want to do is add a couple sentences about stuff we're interested in. We do not want to change the way you manage this program. Uh, Bon? Yeah, so I'll jump on the bandwagon. I think it's a, it sounds like a terrific uh, program, and the examples we heard were, were great. Um, I guess my question is, you started out, and you hit this number of about two million per per program. It seems about right. But was that a fortuitous sweet spot? Uh, have you had to turn away any that are just too big of those that you reject? I'm curious uh, on we, the level. So we don't let them come in bigger. Um, some of the people around the table may, may, may tell you that when they were applicants, they said, oh my god, I, you know, we've put this thing together. We've got so many people excited about this program. We can't possibly do this for just two million dollars. Uh, other advice that we got at the beginning of the program was that we should do it for one million dollars of operating costs. So we just sort of did a seat of the pants and put it out there for two million dollars. And I mean, it, the, you know, it, it's balancing against other parts of the portfolio. The other thing I should say is that we started it in 2000 and it was two million dollars. Uh, we have had some inflation since then. So the value of the grant has actually gone down. Uh, but. Um, uh, we're just trying to balance all the factors, and two million is a nice round number. If you have, uh, we we haven't come up with a strong rationale for changing from that. Just so everyone's on the same page, that's two million dollars in direct cost. Direct cost. So, so the typical grant size is more like three million in total. Right, and that two million, by the way, we we have specifically to not discourage uh, uh, partnerships. Um, that, in our calculation of the two million direct cost, is it does not. Include the indirect cost from a 
collaboration at another institution. Because we want to, if anything, encourage rather than discourage. So actually, actually, now the NIH rules say that. But when we started this, the NIH rules did not say that. Jill. I was just wondering about that because when Dee Dee described her her SEGS, it's you know there, there were a huge number of names there, and and I'm just wondering to what you know what's the average size in terms of people that are funded versus leveraging other sources of of funding to sort of grow out the efforts or something. Over, over the time period, so people come and go. So it, it would average around 50, counting everyone, students. Five though? Back, yeah. At it right now? I mean, well, in the last year, the it's grant was 50? a lot for $2 million okay. direct. Okay. And probably yours is a little smaller than that? It is smaller. So, so we would tend to probably have uh, maybe a total of 20 people, including graduate students, postdocs, and PIs over the four or five labs that would be participating at any one time. Uh, but again, if you integrate it over time, you could add quite a few names. Right. But um, So this was a big question that came up when one of, I won't mention the name, but one of the labs that had one of these and did apply for a renewal, which ultimately wasn't awarded, the renewal of that particular grant, um, people were kind of astounded by the amount of progress that had been made and said, well, you know, how much of the, this progress that you're telling about is from the SEGS grant versus others? And he said, oh, it's almost all from the SEGS. He said, I do have another grant, but that has an, uh, another big grant from another agency, but that has a completely separate set of aims. And there's some synergy, but so um, m I think most of these, uh, probably at least the beginning, don't have a lot of leverage. You have to find ways to, you know, to keep some of the activity focused, parts of the activity going toward the end, particularly. Um, just uh, at the risk of s stepping into something that um, you may have thought about a great deal already, um, I know one thing I did study way back when, um, when I was looking at collaborations among institutions that were funded by NIH was the glue grants that were done by NIGMS. I assume that you guys studied that closely, that whole experience closely to kind of make sure that you avoided those mistakes. We know they're a nightmare to review. <laughs> well, um, in addition, there was a report that was done on kind of what went wrong and why, the, you know, they decided not to continue, and IGMS decided not to continue with those glue grants. And it sounds like yeah, that's a good suggestion. you're avoiding those problems, and that's great. But, you know, there is a nice report by, um, by NIGMS actually evaluating what went wrong. So, um, I don't want to cut the discussion off, but I also don't want to drag it out unnecessarily. I'm hearing pretty strong enthusiasm that the program should continue, that barring deep insights into reasons to change the costs, uh, we are probably about in the right range. And that again, also that the idea of having about, uh, probably not more than about 10 of them, but having up to 10 of them at any time, budget allowing. Uh, sounds like a good overall plan. Is that correct? The, Is that a reasonable the, summary? Can the number be something that's, I mean, you say about 10, but when we looked at the budget overall and the priorities, it seems like, and it's not every year, you'll, maybe one year you have three stellar grants. I mean, the flexibility to vary around the 10? Yeah, plus I, or minus so I, two I or think three. The, the 10 is more of a way to send a message to the community um, that that these are really going to be highly competitive and that if they see that we have seven of them it's not like we're going to award five or six or seven more this year so uh, that it's been useful that way to say these are this is really competitive um, but yes there there have been years when we've funded multiple and um, so people are hearing the suggestion that we might go over 10 do i see sort of nodding or depends on availability of funds and whatever. And, and what we discuss uh, in a discussion like we're going to have tomorrow about, about priorities. Well, could and you, that's something that we revisit. Could you tell us, what, without divulging anything, what you see? Do you, do you find yourself just pulling your hair out because you've got three really good ones and you only feel like you can fund one? I would say generally no. Um, there was one year when we wanted to fund a couple and we were really constrained for budget. And what we did was we got them both started uh, on lower budgets. 
And it turned out they were doing fine on those budgets. They would have liked to have more money. There was no question <laughs> about that. But they were doing acceptably. And then uh, you know, we were able to add some supplements here and there. Uh, but we, we try to manage it as best we can. But I, I would say no, there have not been cases where, you know, we were, where we really, really wanted to fund two more and couldn't do it, if I remember correctly. Again, people back there remind me. I do think one of the strengths of the program is this bottom-up aspect, and that, that is going to mean uh, flexibility in, in what looks like uh, a great set of proposals or not. Yeah. And over time, that average of 10 has worked out to less than 10 because it's been seen sort of as a maximum against which um, sometimes uh, you're, you're less, right? So I think right now, if you counted them up, uh, there'd be six with the current round then uh, currently under review, but there'll probably be less than 10 in, in the coming year. Yeah. I would yeah. say that I think it's appropriate that the size of the program depends upon the quality and the novelty and the innovation of the ideas, but I think that also means uh, you should be prepared for the possibility that some years would bounce above yeah. 10 instead of, uh, instead of below. Yeah, I mean, it partially it's, you know, PIs or, or potential applicants are, are doing a calculation. Well, they have six of these. Um, you know, I'm going to be competing. I don't know how many more applications will come in. They make a calculation of how they want to invest their grant writing time. I'm just wondering if there's any way you could uh, partner this program with your SBIR portfolio so you could maybe uh, add something on top of that since there's discussion of IP and spin outs. Hmm. Boy, that's uh, it, it really is separate money. Um, I guess uh, there's nothing to stop applicants from coming in with a small business, though it would be, you know, centers, centers dollars, not SBIR dollars. That gets, that gets really complicated. I guess the, the only other comment I'd make there is we actually fund companies. At NHGRI, again, we're kind of unusual. We fund companies under RPGs uh, when they're the right place to do that particular kind of research. And a lot of our technology development, por development portfolio does involve IP and licensing and spinning out to companies, some of which then become small businesses and are eligible for SBIR money. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I think it's uh, mechanistically, it's pretty hard. <laughs> OK, I think we're finished here. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Council.